I had eye sales with Dr. Parkhurst in December of 2023, and to say it's been life-changing is an understatement. Whenever anyone finds out about my eye seals, though, their first reaction is always, wow, you must have been a minus 10. I've actually worn minus 425 contact lenses since the eighth grade, so the misconception that eye seals are exclusively a last resort for sky-high myopes needs to change. I chose this technology because of its unique advantages. I and many others have also chosen this technology for my family. I had the awesome experience of getting to be my wife's Evo ICL surgeon in October. At Parker's New Vision, our approach is to offer ICLs to any patient that qualifies, including the low and moderate myopes. We wrote this article recently on a similar topic, but the takeaways are that for us, anyone with minus two and a half diopters of spherical equivalence and an ACD of around 2.8 millimeters, ICLs should definitely be part of the discussion. I have to qualify that statement by saying that the FDA approval for ICLs at this time requires an internal ACD of 3.0 millimeters or greater, but we feel comfortable with an ACD of down to 2.6 millimeters if the anatomy is appropriate. Our routine is to do short interval, same day bilateral surgery, but in these lower ACD patients, we will do one eye at a time to ensure a safe fit. Patients likely have never heard of ICLs when they come in for LASIK, so it's important to introduce them to the technology in a gentle and positive way. This can start at the initial phone call or through educational materials sent directly to patients. It is a delicate balance to appropriately hype up the benefits of ICLs without disparaging LASIK, but here are the main points to emphasize. One, they're completely reversible. We are adding a technology to your eye that can be removed and or upgraded at any time. In this way, I truly believe they are the least invasive vision correction solution available, and this resonates deeply with patients. Two, there is basically no recovery time. I will never forget the moment Dr. Parkhurst removed the microscope from my first eye and I could immediately see the details on the ceiling of the OR. The speed of recovery is also one of my favorite things to hear from patients. My vision was 2012 only an hour after surgery, and while yes, LASIK and smile are usually there the next morning, we live in a world of immediate gratification, and the style points from immediate improvement and minimal discomfort are hard to beat. Three, call it stods, temporary dry eye, or whatever you want, but eye seals are very unlikely to even temporarily worsen dry eye symptoms. Patients who are prone to symptoms of dryness will be very interested in a procedure with essentially no recovery that is unlikely to cause even minimal irritation. And four, flexibility can be a hard concept to convey to patients, but because we're not changing anything about the eye, when cataracts or refractive lens exchanges come knocking, they can enjoy access to every technology on the market. This is something I do find worth discussing, especially with the analytical personality types. Can you tell from these videos which eye is the low myope? The only tell is the eye seal itself, since the EVO Plus model has a larger optic. There's no difference in feeling or technique during the actual surgery. Since sizing is one of the more nuanced areas of ICLs, let's go over a couple of pearls. Consider venturing beyond white to white. The anatomy of the space where the ICL will sit is complex. Consider anterior segment OCT or UBM. Our go-to combination is the ARC scan with the London Vision nomogram. Another excellent nomogram is the ICL Guru with Sonomed. Since Dr. Parker's developed one of the earliest and most effective nomograms using the Sonomed, that is still in many ways our gold standard or spot check to make sure everything is making sense based on our experience. Some enterprising groups are even working on AI-driven OCT nomogram models. In fact, we recently analyzed data from nearly a thousand of our commercial ICL cases and found that we only had a 1.1% exchange rate due to sizing. Most of these were rotated toric ICLs due to insufficient horizontal compression to prevent rotation. Be consistent with methodology. The more regular the process is, the more comfortable both yourself and your staff will become with sizing. Don't just reserve UBM for patients you aren't sure about. Do it for everyone. There is definitely a learning curve to UBM, so using it consistently is key, and don't expect to just jump into it and have it totally change everything or only use it on select cases. You may have heard there's really only two sizes, 12.6 and 13.2. While there is some truth to that sentiment and 95% of ICLs will probably be one of those two sizes, the extremely rare times that ICLs will bite are likely to be occasions when not implanting a 12.1 or 13.7 out of fear when you should have. If the nomogram you're consistently using is recommending 12.1 or 13.7, then you should trust your process and not force everyone into either 12.6 or 13.2. Sulcus to sulcus and lens rise and anterior chamber depth are the best predictors for vault and you will develop a pattern recognition over time. 
For example, massive ACDs are more likely to tolerate large ICLs even if fault is higher because the angle has more space to work with. A caveat that I'll add to this is that almost a quarter of the ICLs I've done at PNV have been in eyes with ACDs under 3.0 millimeters. We have proven that this is safe and the cutoff is somewhat arbitrary considering the European CE mark for ACDs is 2.8 millimeters and greater. That being said, our completely anecdotal experience is that these shallower eyes are better hedging down. For example, 12.6 is usually the answer over 13.2. If the sulcus to sulcus is very small, then these eyes are likely perfect for 12.1. On the other side, we hedge up on Torix, especially if patients are between 12.6 and 13.2. It might save a lot of trouble if the lens is a little larger and resists rotation. There are many tips to ensure stability and customized fitting, such as orienting the lens vertically, but the only technique we routinely use to fudge fitting is hedging up on the toric side, as long as the angle and anterior chamber look like they can tolerate it. And just as one rule of thumb, our ideal post-op vault on a normal ACDI is 750 or even 800. Don't be afraid of vaults between 500 and 1000. That's actually the sweet spot most of the time, which brings us to our last point. Be confident, the EVO ICL is so remarkably tolerant to a wide range of vault. Consider a patient like this. It would be more risk to exchange this than to just watch it, and it's been totally okay so far. Lastly, I need to mention that vault isn't really the entire story. This case really emphasizes that. On first glance at the OCT, you might get nervous seeing a vault this high, but consider the wider ASOCT, in this case taken on the MS39. The angles are still 24 degrees, the chamber is plenty deep, and there's hardly any anterior positioning of the iris. For this eye, to almost 1200 microns is the perfect vault. While I've been talking to you, you may have noticed the video playing in the corner. This was a real-time, unedited video of an entire ICL surgery. It took me longer to give this talk than to implant an ICL. What other procedure is as fast with as rapid of a visual recovery? Up to 16 diopters of myopia treated in five minutes. Everyone who is eligible deserves access to this technology.